Hello and welcome to the Humanity Inspires podcast. I'm your host, Mark Philpott. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. It's great to have you here if you're a first time listening to Humanity Inspires. Thank you for coming. I hope you're well, no matter where you are in the world today. It's a crazy old place we live in, isn't it? And that's why, well, it's one of the reasons I wanted to do this show, so we get back to having real conversations about real stuff with people. And that's what the show's all about. It's a freestyle conversation show where we discuss whatever's on our mind on that particular day, and I let my guests go as deep and as meaningful as they want to. There are no rules, there are no limits. So if you'd like to be on the Humanity Inspire show, reach out to me via social media and we'll have a chat about you coming on the show with a real conversation. Now, my guest today, she's been a friend of mine for a little while now and she's one of those people that loves to travel around the world. She's doing some really interesting stuff. She's been on my other podcast shows before. Her name is Natalie Thomas. Let's go meet Natalie right now. Natalie Thomas, welcome. Thank you for having me today, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. You might not say that afterwards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, who knows? That is very true. <laughs> who knows what's going to come about through this show? Have you ever done anything like this before? I don't think so. I think the majority of podcasts I've done have been, I wouldn't say scripted, but there's been a series of questions that I knew were coming. And I think this is the first time where it's more freestyle, but I I like it because I don't like planning too much. Like too much planning makes me oof. I like I like rolling with it. You're a Sagittarius, that's why. <laughs> exactly, double Sagittarius. <laughs> My rising is also Sag. Oh wow. Okay, so no planning at all is the best way to go for you. Yeah, I think when it comes to planning and it comes to horoscopes that's more for earth signs which is capricorn um taurus and what's the other one how am i forgetting this capricorn taurus and virgo so mm. they're more of the planners they're the more grounded they need a they need a set plan throughout their day and lucky me i have no earth in my chart so <laughs> that's something i strive for is to be more grounded and I guess planned. Well, that's funny you say that because I have this conflict going on all the time because I'm born on the cusp of Aquarius and Capricorn. Ooh, yeah. So I kind of had this deep decided need to plan and organize and you know mm -hmm. be process driven and then I have this other side which is completely spontaneous and creative and mm -hmm. out there dreaming you know. The Aquarius side of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah so um have fun balance. with that sometimes it's a bit of a nightmare actually I <laughs> sometimes i it's just so funny you say that mark i've had chart readers look at my chart and they have like a ooh sound when they pull it up and i'm always like wait what i always get the oof all right let's let's dig into this <laughs> so have you I always totally been into astrology is it something you've always been interested in um I would say so. Um, my, I think my interest for astrology started when I was really young. I, I was around 12. Oh, yeah, about 12. And it was really because my mother, she was, and my, and, you know, I'm actually from a Catholic background. Like my, it's not like I came from this, like a hippie family or anything. Um, but my mom was always like, you're such a Sagittarius. And mm. I'm like, oh, what are you, what is my mom talking about? And when I was about 13, um, maybe you know, seventh or eighth grade, my mom gave me a book about being a Sagittarius, <laughs> literally. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and I drew an interest in it then. So that was the late 90s, early 2000s. And then I remember just Googling Sagittarius traits, Sagittarius women. And then I started um, looking at my friends and their signs. And it, it was an ever-evolving process, but I think 
I gauged more interest when I first had my chart read. So, mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Do you identify with people now by their star signs? Can you see traits in people Definitely. without even knowing what star sign they are and, and be accurate with that? Yes, I can. We should do mm. a game one day. We should like bring people on or... Or by, I think I would have to see them and talk to them for a second. <laughs> and then we, we can do a name your star sign episode. Mm. I actually <laughs> do that. Again. I actually do that on my travel show. I just about ask every single one of my guests what star sign they are, but I try to guess it beforehand. And I've got about an 80% accuracy rate going at the moment. Wow. And what is the percentage for your... Well, the most, are, uh, the most travelers, right? People that just love to get out there and get lost in the world of uh, Sagittarians and Geminis yeah and uh, they're the two prominent ones so um, a lot of my guests have been Sagittarians and Geminis yeah. and then you get your Taurus and your um, Aquarians mm-hmm. those are probably the next two biggest yeah well I think well Sagittarius and Gemini they're the they're the two traveler signs for sure, and the two most independent signs of the zodiac. And they're actually, if um, I would say, not opposites, but they're directly across from each other. So they play off of each other very well. Um, for example, Sagittarius is the philosopher, and mm. that's why they like to travel, and you know they they're always seeking a, a deeper meaning. Yep. Um, but the Gemini, their communication, so they like communicating and talking. So those two signs it's interesting that those are your top two for your guests <laughs> yeah they complement yeah. each other well too yeah they they really do and um i notice a lot of traits in them in terms of they both don't like sitting around getting bored right they like to be on the move all the time mm-hmm. oh exactly like moving they like change it's not that they i wouldn't say everyone loves change it's more um the excitement the new people like and you know what i touched on the philosophy the communication aspect of it Mm. Mm -hmm. i used to use that astrology connection uh in my corporate life Uh, i used Mm -hmm. to i used to study that and i used to um when i went and did business deals i sussed out the people based on what star sign they were and i used to always just ask them what their birthday was and as a part of the general you know chat chat and then i could know exactly how i had to deal with them to get what i wanted from the business deal it was a very interesting process that's really true it helps you understand people i think a bit better um understand their strengths weaknesses quirks personality and off of that too have you heard of the enneagram no what's that so the Enneagram is a series of tests that you can take and then you wind up with a number and mm. each number has a different personality traits, a different, um, it, it's almost, I wouldn't say it's like horoscopes, but it's very similar where okay. you can, you can get it in, you can have an Enneagram test and yep. based off of that number, you can understand people's personalities and the way they, their demeanors. I haven't looked too, too much into it, but in my yoga teacher training in Bali two years ago, it was required for us to do a test. We we actually went through like a, a, a course on it. Um, so it's all kind of interrelated how you can use the Enneagram, the horoscopes. I, um, I know the Myers-Briggs is a popular one too, to mm. assess people's personalities. Yeah, I've done Myers-Briggs a couple of times actually. Mm-hmm. I find that just getting back to that corporate thing, I, I found that um, the best thing that came out of that for me was when I found out what star sign they were. It allowed me to be a better communicator with them because I understood how I had to communicate to get my message across to them. And I think that's a really powerful thing. If you know how somebody takes in information and how they digest it and how they see things, and, and let's face it, some people are very, very visual. They need to see, have a picture painted for them. Whereas others need a lot of technical detail, right? So, and and others are very compassionate. Like whenever I talk to Virgos, I know that you know they're all about emotion and feeling, and mm-hmm. they they they're they're very big on all that sort of stuff and what's going to make the world a better place. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's really interesting. I think it's um you know I think more they should probably teach this stuff at schools, right? Well, this would be really handy for young people to understand and learn and help them throughout their life journey. It would be so helpful and more about that with the schools, but I will say, and actually I'll ask you, 
Did you find too, like over time and through the years, because I found myself, um, this was a realization personally, that as you read more about it and as you study more horoscopes and meeting people, you can pick it. You can pick up people's signs faster. Like it becomes mm. stronger. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have found that. I think that it all it's all related to your own consciousness and awareness, isn't it? Like I think yeah. a lot of things evolve and, it, and to a large extent, I think it's irrelevant on how old you are. I think it's about how conscious and aware you are at different stages of your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that corporate life for me was many years ago and, and I used to do things like that then, but I wouldn't say in any way I'm anywhere near as spiritual as I am today back then because I wasn't yep. and that was just one element that I had a um, I guess it was one tool that I had in my toolbox back then right and since then a lot of other things have evolved so yeah it's an interesting journey that whole spiritual development and as you know and as I know of you there's a lot going on in both of our lives in that area and I find it fascinating to talk to people of different ages how old are you today Nat? I'm 33 33 yeah mm -hmm. so I, I find that people of a younger age today are becoming more spiritually conscious than yeah. perhaps my generation were at that age um, mm -hmm. or maybe I wasn't connected to them at that age you know, it's a bit hard to say mm -hmm. I guess um, no, that is true, but, though. but I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot more conscious living around the world today of younger people and you've only got to see by the you know activism that's going on and different things whether it be climate change or equality and all that sort of stuff that's driven by the younger generation to a large extent right yeah for sure and in schools that you mentioned um i think sub mindfulness is slowly creeping its way into schools yeah it is and i i think the whole you know, I have a fairly strong opinion about this. I think the whole school system needs to be basically torn down and redone because it's, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we're learning these sorts of things through COVID because parents are spending more time probably with their children at home now and doing a lot of homeschooling and stuff and seeing exactly what they're being taught at school rather than mm -hmm. maybe checking up on it once a month or something, you know? No, for sure. I actually, um, I, I just started working um, with a the company that teaches meditations in schools mm. for a wide range of ages. So I think, what was the youngest? I think three. I started, yeah. so I just started three. teaching. Three. Wow. So I just started teaching <clears throat> um, kids and it, it's really ages, well, their program is ages three to 18, so to say, like senior in high school. Mm. And so they're incorporating that now with the school systems. And I remember my first class I did, you know, the, the parents are there with the kids. Um, but, the, but yeah, there was as young as three. It, I mean, part of me is wow. like, are they really going to meditate? But you know what? I guess they're listening to it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And it was really sweet. So we did a little meditation and we did a visualization exercise. So it's really nice to see children open to that and parents who are supportive of that in the development um you know with their for their children yeah yeah that's amazing three years old what country is this in the u.s <laughs> this in the is, u.s uh, okay. mostly new york it was the, the school districts that i've been working with are mostly new york and yeah yeah washington dc was another one so uh, it was mostly Northeast, but they're, they've opened it up to the whole country and they want to go more global with different countries as well. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would have expected you to say somewhere like India or Sri Lanka or somewhere, but uh, New York City, wow, that's a big one, isn't it? New York. <laughs> exactly. So... One of the hardest places in the world to live and uh, they're, they're doing that sort of thing in school. That's great though. That's fantastic. It's so, it's so amazing. And I feel, Mark, I feel really lucky because my first step into all this, I don't even know if I told you, maybe I've told you, was when I was nine or 10. Um, I, I think, you know, I was a diver, so I was a springboard mm. diver. And mm. the changing moment, I would say, of my young <laughs> life as a kid or in going into sports was my coach had us watch a visualization tape. Like, you know, the, the old VHS <laughs> made mm. in like 1979, like visualization technique. And I was nine or 10 when I watched it. I think it was like 1990, like late 90s, I watched it. Mm. And it taught 
it taught us the, the importance of how to train your mind to dive and how to train your mind to do sports. And all of the techniques it taught us were all the meditation and mindful techniques that we have today. The power of positive thinking, the power of um, using repetition over and over again. And what they really harped upon was how to visualize, I'll just use diving as an example, how to do the dive correctly versus doing it wrong. So mm. I had to visualize, okay, I'm doing this dive and I'm doing it perfectly. This is what it looks like, but not visualizing don't mess up because that means yeah. mess up. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I'm thinking, looking back on that experience, that was so valuable. And going back to the school systems, if we can teach children um, the positive aspects of <clears throat> even just visualization techniques mm -hmm. in a positive light, I think kids will emerge more powerful more you know mindful and because it even really helped me in the workforce yeah i bet it did mm -hmm. i think there's a really great um conversation to be had around this because i've been doing a lot of research lately about the evolution of the human species and mm -hmm. how we look at how we're going to evolve into the future and if you look at us from a physiological point of view, we haven't really changed much in 10,000 years in terms of mm -hmm. the way that we are as humans, but the capacity that we've had to use our brain more and tap into the resources within ourselves has become greater. And as a result of that, we've taken, some would say leaps backwards, but we've also taken leaps forwards in terms of what we've been able to achieve. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really interesting to understand that the neurons that are inside our brain can actually be activated in different ways and we can actually become more intelligent as we get older and if we know how to train that part of our brain and uh, I think that there's so much untapped consciousness within each of us that regardless of our age um, if we can open that door somehow and find the, the things that work for us individually and you know this is not something and I wanted to talk to you about this today because there's a lot of people out there that you know preach about you know you do this and you'll feel better and you'll be a better person or risk it but as I'm finding on my journey it's about experimentation and finding out what it is that actually unlocks the secrets for yourself mm -hmm. and you know take the analogy of going to a gym to get fit okay if you walk into a gym and you say to a gym instructor okay I want to get fit mm -hmm. well they've got to look at the starting point what's the baseline that they're working with what's your background in terms of experience with exercise what's mm -hmm. your physiological condition today what's your emotional condition today mm -hmm. how how much are you going to be able to stand in terms of physical endur in, endurance how much are you going to be able to stand emotionally mm -hmm. what's your commitment level um, how many days a week can you go all those things right so if you actually write that down for everybody everybody's different mm -hmm. And prescribing the same, I guess, program for anybody is not going to work because it needs to be tailor-made for you. And, you know, these physical instructors say, well, I'll tailor make a program for you. But I wonder how many of them actually spend time looking at the psychological aspect of it all rather than how many weights I can lift or how many reps I can do of different exercises. Because it's not until we train that mind to be committed in a certain way that we really get the results that we're after, right? I think it's great that you talk about the visualization aspect because if we can teach younger people to do that at a younger age, um, it can help them create success in all sorts of different ways in their lives. And as you did with training for diving, which is a, a very unique discipline in itself because there's a lot of other factors involved in, in being a good diver. Um, but if you used and adapted that visualization process into every aspect of your life, and when we talk visualization, we're also talking about the form of meditation around that, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, thinking and concentrating on something that you want to embrace in your life and have abundance of and, and creating that um, new, new life, I think, is, is really, really powerful. I just think it's such an untapped universe for us all to tap into. And now's a great time to do it when the world's lifting upside down and turning around back to front and all the rest of it have you come across a lot of people that are really going through a lot of life change at the moment you know i have um mm. and you did tap on such a good point of finding what works for you yeah uh, just because even through the wellness um 
like the wellness series, I, I've been working a lot with corporate clients actually, and mm -hmm. the stress of the different corporate clients that they're experiencing, um, how people, some people have lost their jobs, some people are, still have jobs, but they're just so stressed. Some yep. people have kids and finding that balance. So mm. I have seen that 100%. And what you said of finding what works best for you, I think is so key. Um, and like going to the gym, like some people like the elliptical machine and some people like the treadmill and some people like the weights. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's really finding that aspect of the mindfulness because it all really goes back to the same thing. The yoga is a form of meditation. I mean, I am a very strong believer in med meditation, but visualization is just like meditation. There's so many yeah. different types of meditation you can do. There's so mm. many different types of yoga you can do. There's so many even different types of journaling that you can do. So it's finding which techniques and which self-care and um, really just works best for you and vibes with you. And that's okay if something doesn't. Mm. It's like, you know, what, what rings true for you? Like, that's true for you. And if, if something, it, there's no set way to have mindfulness. Mm. And I think people have got to stop um, having judgment on others on this because, you know, we, we tend to, and I think everybody does it. We tend to say, well, you know, if you don't, if you don't do it this way or, you know, it worked for me, so it's going to work for you. Try it, try this way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it, you're not, you know, you're not going to get the results. Well, that's bollocks, right? Because oh, you can get results so many different ways, you know, so many different ways. And I, and when I teach <clears throat> private yoga, I work a lot with people who have not, who are too scared to go to a class. They're, they're beginners. Yeah, and they're like, yeah. oh, well, I have to be this certain way when I go to the class. And I'm thinking, is that is that the image we're putting out there? Like, you have to be this amazing, crazy yogi. And you have to be, if you're not meditating two hours a day, like, you're not going to be whatever, lightened, whatever you want to call it. And working with these clients who, most of them are amazing yoga. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They're naturally so good. I'm like, what? Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, but... That's when they're looking at the whole mindfulness and the yoga industry, it's very intimidating. You see everything mm -hmm. that's on Instagram now of the perfect pose. And and yeah. for a lot of people who are embarking on that, it can be very, very scary. So, yeah. And yeah. you could be a complete beginner. And that's yeah, absolutely. totally great. Absolutely. I'll give you a funny story that in terms of that whole how we're different and how we get the results and doing it a different way. I used to run a lot of marathons and... I used to train really hard, you know, I was committed to mm -hmm. spending probably six to eight months training for a race and doing everything as well as I could, maybe it instead of the, well, when I say as, as well as I could back then, it was, I was still having a fair share of uh, sugar and junk food during mm -hmm. the process, but I was convincing myself that because I was running 150 plus kilometers a week in training, I could eat whatever I wanted mm -hmm. and um, didn't realize that it wasn't actually doing me any good. But I used to get to the end of my marathon races and, you know, I feel so good about the achievement of finishing a marathon and I get across the finish line and I would always be, you know, fighting against the time for myself to always try and do a better time. Mm -hmm. And I'd get across the line and I'd look up and I'd see someone in front of me who was twice the size of me, you know, mm -hmm. and they got there to the finish line before I did. And I just thought, how is that possible? Like that person's like weighing twice as much as I do. And here they are, they've run the marathon faster than I have. I put in eight months of training. I know how dedicated I've been and all the things that I've done. And it used to really, really upset me. Like I used to get really annoyed. <laughs> anyway, one day I, I ran the Paris marathon and I finished and the same thing happened again. There was this guy in front of me and he was massive. <laughs> And I thought, right, that's it. I've got to go and have a chat to him. So mm -hmm. I went over and I said, how is it possible that you, what, I asked him first of all, what time did you run? And he actually finished about three or four minutes before me. And I said, how did you, how long have you been training for this? He said, oh, only about a month and a half, two months. And that made me even madder because. Oh <laughs> thought, my gosh, I'm sure. And, and I just said, how did you do it? And he said, I don't know. I've just got it in me to be able to do it. right?" And, and I went away from then. I just thought, yeah, that's that's the answer right there is that everybody has it in them to do something that's different than what you and I can do. Uh -huh. And you know, they don't need to train as much. They don't need to eat as well. They can just do it. 
and it's just yeah. the fact of life right that people can do stuff <laughs> oh for sure and I will say, Mark, running marathons is not one of my strong suits. And that I know. <laughs> <laughs> that I but realized I... very young, at a very young age. <laughs> well, I'm sure if uh, if you and I were at a swimming pool and I dived off the high board, you would be able to critique me no end on how useless oh. I was as a diver in that. But uh, yeah, oh. I, I guess we can use the analogy in a lot of different things in life, right? There'll be always somebody that can do it better than you. There'll be yeah. always someone that's smarter than you and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, right? We just mm -hmm. got to live with it. <laughs> exactly. But that's a good point, though. It's like everyone's different and we're all wired so differently. So nothing's mm. going to be the exact for everyone. Mm. So what do you think of this notion then based on what you just said? Everyone's wired differently. What, what's this thing about we're all the same? Like everybody keeps going on about how we are all so much the same. Is, is that true in your eyes or are we all so different? Do you know what? That's a very interesting question and hmm, I can get real deep on this fast, but I'll start. So it's really, in, there's so many different, how do you say it, paradoxes to this. It's like we're all same, but we're all different. We are everything, but we are nothing. And we are all the same as in we come from, let's say, the same place, in my opinion. Mm. Like we come from source. We come from this one being of all that is. Mm. Uh, what's, your, what's your belief system around that? Where, what do you, where do you take creation to or from? Where's creation come from for you? You know, when people say God, it, mm. to me, that's not this guy sitting on a cloud like condemning people for like, I'm God, maybe you're a part of God or plants, animals. You can call that source, um, mm. source of all that is universe creation. Uh, I don't think someone's sitting on a cloud and, you know, uh, we're appearing on earth type of thing, but we all are, our energy, we are made up of energy. Our energy comes from a very similar, all the same place, our energy, our matter, our souls. And again, everyone, you know, take what vibes with you and discard the rest. Um, but for me, what rings true and what I resonate with is we are all souls having an earthly body, body experience and our souls come from the same place. So we are all very connected. It's actually quantum physics. Like what I, how I react to someone has a ripple effect on the world. We are literally connected to each other. And that's why as we raise our consciousness and we practice mindfulness, we even naturally start to change people around us. I don't know if you notice that, but um, it, you know, the more you read, the more you, you study, then maybe your loved ones, your friends, they, they draw an interest because we all have this connection to each other. But when you say we're all different, we are all wired differently. We all have different upbringings. We all might have different expectations, and that's just based on our conditioning as kids and our conditioning with our parents, our environment, the countries we grew up in, the languages we grew up in. So we value, we need to value our, our differences, but we're really coming from the same place. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. <laughs> it's like the best way mm. I can describe it. No, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and in listening to you, I get a, um, a strong feeling of that understanding of the source as you mention it. Do you think we're alone in the universe? Oh, like with other um, beings? Well, other existence. Like, yeah. So yes. you called us energy, right? So do you think yeah. there's other variations of energy out there in the universe that are similar or like us in any way? Oh, I just got chills. Yes, I do. I, mm -hmm. I do believe that there's other forms of life. Um, they can even be higher vibe than we are for in a lot of readings that I've done and a lot of studying on this matter. They say that earth is a very low vibration. Like we come to earth to learn our lessons as a soul. Like we come here to learn. And I think all of us can attest and look back at our lives and think about all the learning that we've acquired so far, <laughs> the hard times we've had, the hardships, but also the great moments, learning how to have joy, learning how to give love, lear learning the balance between light and dark like there's so much learning that we have on this earth but it's a it's a low density place and i'm not saying that we come here because we're low vibe people it's the fastest way for us to grow the growth here mm. for our souls is very very um because it's an intense experience it also can be a very happy experience um but it forces us to learn quickly our souls grow faster but i do believe that there are other places that are um 
with other life forms. I, I'm not sure how, how many life forms there are. Um, n not all of them come from a bad place. I know I watched the movie Independence Day when I was younger and that scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> so it's not like <laughs> one of my favorite movies. No, so it's not, qu like, not quite like that. Well, maybe, I don't know. I really can't say. Uh, but I do think that there's other life out there. Mm. Do you think we've been put here as some kind of experiment? Oh my gosh, that's like the what's it, like the Matrix thing. <laughs> I don't. Uh, Does that make you feel uncomfortable? That thought. Do you know what? I've wavered with this. This is why. Like mm. yes, it can. Like you know, we're all just like a big science experiment. Is that what they say? Mm. <laughs> we're mm. sci we're a science experiment. Do you know? I don't think we're so much an experiment. I think we do have our our mission here, and we all came here for a reason for our souls to grow and I think that part is still very very strong whether or not we're an experiment I don't know but I do think our souls move on past the earthly existence for our so bodies what, are just like a shell so what's the meaning of life to you soul growth to grow soul growth what, what, yeah. so so explain to me and everybody listening what you deem that to be what is soul growth so soul growth is, let's say, when you start this life and you maybe look back on your life, how did you grow as a person? Who did you help? What, what lessons did you learn? How did you help others? Those are the main things that we want to really think about throughout our lives. Are we doing things with integrity and intention? How are we growing? Because when we grow... And when we practice meditation or mindfulness techniques or just even yoga, you literally raise your vibration and you feel it. There's a reason why yoga and meditation is so popular because you raise your vibration and you feel better. You're, and I would also say that with your soul, as you go through these experiences and you're learning, we're going to, okay, now we're going to get super deep, that mm. when you pass, then in the, if, if you believe in reincarnation or not, so say you pass and then say you come back, then you have to keep rising your soul growth. I don't know if that makes sense because they say there's a lot of different soul levels. There's a book called um, Echoes of the Soul, mm -hmm. um, which this is, that was one of the first books that came to mind by Echo Bodine. I read the book years ago and it talks about different levels of soul growth, how one is more that survival mode, um, you know, you don't really think for your, you're, you're only thinking for yourself. Two, you start to have family, friends. Three, it's maybe more like um, religious or like very strong faith-based. So there's different levels of soul growth per the book, which is very interesting read. Even if you're just curious, I, I recommend. But they say as you keep practicing and as you work on yourself, you naturally start to evolve. It's like a way to mm. evolve. I'm interested mm -hmm. in this concept you talk of about books and... Mm -hmm where we get our information from mm -hmm. because it's i think it's a lot of the problems uh, the result of a lot of problems we have in the world today is because mm -hmm. we we hear things and we listen to things and then we mm -hmm. believe things right yeah and it's those beliefs that we take on board that create differences between us and mm -hmm. you can go back to all the wars that have happened in the world and mm -hmm. they've happened because of different belief systems right People have believed um, a dictator and, and when a dictator says this is the way we need to be, people have believed that. They brought into the to the messaging, the story and, and said, right, we're going to stay firm behind this. And mm -hmm. if you look across society today, we have people in tribes who believe certain things about whatever is going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And we've got to, we don't have to, but I've got to say this in the right way than the context, which is what I believe is mm -hmm. that books are written by people mm -hmm. and people have opinions about mm -hmm. things right and yeah. it's just like all the things that you've just been sharing about your opinion based on the things that you've read and you've created in your mind and in your soul a, a vision and a belief system of what the universe and the world and life means to you mm -hmm. and we all do that through either extensive knowledge base or limited knowledge base depending on how much you spend time researching and getting all these things together because let's face it not everybody's walking around the world going right i want to understand the meaning of life and i'm going to invest course. time to you know 
So mm-hmm. we're all at we're all at these different stages of our own belief systems as well. Yeah. And I th- I think what's interesting to me, and I used to be one of these people where I was very confrontational when it came to people challenging my belief system because mm-hmm. I hang on a minute, that's I'm entitled to believe what I I believe in. But I also want to be very open to what the other possibilities are because the other possibilities could be really exciting, right? Mm -hmm. And to think that the universe is as great as it is and that we've only been exploring it for such a small period of time in terms of our species has, has only had very limited ability to be able to explore our universe and understand it. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about things like physics and we talk about things like atoms, well, we don't even know what an atom is. We know how to collide it. We know how to split it. But we don't know what an atom actually is. And there's no physicist on this planet that can actually tell you what an atom is. Sure. And I find that really fascinating because in many things in this evolution of life on Earth, we've we've jumped over and gone ahead in some areas and without even really understanding factually, right, the yeah. science behind the reality of it all. And I find that really interesting because you've got people like Elon Musk that want to go and populate another planet, which I think is fantastic. And you've got other things that are happening here on Earth that we don't have any understanding on whatsoever. And we've already talked about one in terms of the capacity of the human brain, right? We, we don't know what our limits are because there probably aren't any when it comes to our brain. Yes. So, I don't know, I just threw a whole lot of jargon together there, but I was just trying to say that the for me life is unlimited right yeah totally totally agree and do you know what's interesting about that mark Mm. it's going back to what we were talking about with the mindfulness practices Mm. it's something if it vibes with you that that's totally okay if it doesn't it's finding something that vibes with you and that but that makes you feel good and that's positive you know it's okay if something is different someone has it's okay if somebody has completely different beliefs it's okay if um, they use different techniques or just, you know, ways of the universe. This is how the universe works, and that's why that's totally fine. It's having that non attachment. Um, yeah. And I only bring this up too with like all, you know, with the books, and it's finding something that's having a positive effect on you. And a lot of the reasons that I, I guess you can say I've been studying this and reading a lot of this, these concepts in so many different ways. Well, even Albert Einstein has talked massively about this in quantum physics. Um, it's because I noticed a difference in myself of how I started to change for the better, how mm-hmm. I became less anxious, how my anxiety decreased. I was less stressed. I was more understanding. Life started to shift. And it's just tools that I, I like to call them tools. They're just tools, understandings that I picked up that vibe with me. And some of the stuff that I started reading eight years ago doesn't even vibe with me anymore. And that's okay. And then new information comes my way. So it's, it's not really a being attached to it. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, this has helped me in a lot of ways in the mindfulness. But it's, always, it's, it's probably going to change even more throughout my lifetime and throughout everyone's lifetime. I would say that in a lot of cases, people are attached to things, though, that create the negativity, right? Because they can't let go of it. And I was watching, have you come across David Goggins? Do you know who David Goggins is? No, I haven't. Okay. He's he's one of those ones that I've, I've kind of embraced at the moment on my journey. And he's got an extraordinary story to share because he was 380 pounds, I think he was as a young black boy living in America and um, he had no hope and and couldn't do anything really and as far as life as a young kid and he was being bullied all the time anyway long story short he joined the uh, the US Navy he became a Navy SEAL and he went through buds and did all the training and came out the other side he went through three buds which hardly anybody's ever been able to do and now he's an ultra distance runner and um, he's a proponent for healthy living and he's about 170 pounds and, um, you know, muscle man and all the rest of it. Anyway, he's got a really interesting story to tell. Wow. But he's very, um, he's very in your face and he's not a guy that a lot of people would like because he, he calls it straight for straight. And mm-hmm. he's a guy that kind of says, right, away with all the bullshit and just 
get on with life stop making excuses what you did 10 years ago you can't change now right it's all in your mind and mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff and i'm a big proponent of that as well because i think too many people hold on to things for too long yeah and you know it not only makes you physically ill and gives you disease but it also cramps up your mind in terms of your mental capacity holding on to these things for so long mm -hmm. so one of the other things i wanted to talk to you about today was the power of forgiveness mm -hmm. and Huge. how important how important i think that is in our journey because being able to forgive someone is probably the the hardest thing to do at some stage but it's also probably the most powerful thing that we can do for ourselves more more so than the person that we're forgiving sometimes what are, you, what are your thoughts around that that is so true and this was something else i was actually thinking of um the power of forgiveness another re that's a great way for soul growth in my opinion it really yeah. it teaches you a lot and i am going to go back to a book again i know i love to read um it's called the disappearance of the universe it's one mm -hmm. of my favorite books and i read it so quickly i and going back to what vibes with you mark and like mm. you as in like everyone listening mm. i tried to give this book to five people and they read like three pages and they're like boring or no way <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's all good if <laughs> Isn't that like, disappointing though? Like I get upset <laughs> when that happens. Like I really do. I recommend books to people and they come back and go, that was a load yeah. of rubbish. And I go, what? How can you say that was a load of rubbish? Like, oh my gosh. It's literally happened with five people from this book. And I'm like, <laughs> it's my favorite book. Are you kidding? I read this so fast. It has all this insight. And it like really inspired me. And again, like that's why it's like do it vibes best for you without attachment. But the are they book... still friends? Are they still friends? <laughs> they are still friends. So <laughs> it's all good. Everyone's on their own journey. So with this book though, that was the main theme. The main theme was about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it and this the journey of a guy who went through I'm not gonna really give away anything for those who want to read it. Um mm -hmm he kind of had this outer body experience uh, um, experience where his higher self or whatever you want to call it, a being, um, taught him the power of forgiveness and how he had to practice forgiveness in each moment of his life with mm. who he encountered. And, and then he talks about how it massively changed his life, like a massive levels. Yep. And since then, he's written two more books. I've read those as well. I've, I suggested those to no one because <laughs> no, one, <laughs> no one can get past one <laughs> boring you gave so, up book recommendations in it i know i'm really selling myself as like a book recommendation person <laughs> tonight um but anyway the disappearance of the universe and so based off of what you said for forgiveness that was another huge eye-opener for me in learning how to practice forgiveness in throughout our lifetime because again it's that attachment when we forgive someone else we're forgiving ourselves and we free ourselves from that chain from that bond that we feel yeah i would add that um in addition to forgiving others forgiving ourselves is the biggest thing isn't it you know in terms of being not being so hard on ourselves about things that have happened in our lives and the way that we've reacted like you know i've done so many things that i regret in terms of you know the way that i've treated people and, and stuff mm -hmm. and it's not because i'm a nasty person at all it's just because I could have done it better yeah. and I didn't do it better at the time because I wasn't equipped and that's not an excuse that's a reality in terms of I wasn't equipped in the way that I am perhaps today to be able to deal with some of those situations mm -hmm. but you and it was interesting what you yeah and it was interesting what you said and I want to go back to that point before about where you talked about you know as you've read more and evolved and and all the rest of it I think also something that we underestimate is the power of our own natural aging process and wisdom that comes from growing and also hormones as well play a huge part in it as well mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess our physiological evolution as our bodies are changing as we get older we go through those different stages and this happens to you know you, you look at I remember when I was at school and I had a friend of mine who was um, growing growing hair faster than most gorillas do yeah wow. and he he was you know shaving at a very young age and i thought wow that's bizarre like you know he's a real kind of outcast and all the rest mm -hmm. of it 
and then I, I said to him one day, I said, how do you, how do you feel about having to shave every day? He said, I love it. Ah. And, I, and I thought, wow, he's really embraced this in a positive sense, right? And I said, what do you love about it? And he said, because it, it thinks, it makes me think I'm a man already, like I'm a man. Wow. I'm doing something that men do. I shave every day. And he'd embraced this thing that a lot of people were bullying him about and said to himself right i've i see the positive and this is giving me strength and mm -hmm. i'm going to empower that and i thought i thought i didn't think at the time but i look back on that now i thought wow he was really connected to himself you know wow. to, to be able to do that at some, you know, such a young age and not see it as you know he could have easily been a victim there and said look i'm getting bullied every day by people at school for for sure. Telling me how much hair I've gotten or is it, but he turned it around to, to use it as a strength, as a superpower, and I, I really admire that. All about his mindset and what he yeah. sees with himself. Yeah. So he, he was inadvertently forgiving himself for a situation that was beyond his control, mm -hmm. and he was embracing what he had, right, and turned it into a power, which was mm -hmm. really, really cool. That's really powerful. And Has there been someone in your life that stood out more than others that you had to forgive? that I've had to forgive. Yeah, like has there been a really difficult situation in your life where you yes. f forgave someone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to share about it or? Um, I'll share as much as I can. Yeah. Um, it was, so let me think, it was about 10 years ago, I was working on a movie yeah. and I was a personal assistant mm -hmm. um, to an actress and it was one of the hardest things in my entire life that I did and I, I started to build a lot of anger around my job um, in when this person would ask me to do things I would start to get maybe upset or angry and I blamed a lot of when I was at the time I was 24 and what 23 actually so when this job was completed that's what when my I would say my stress levels were super high and just my mental health started to tank from that job. Like I was not sleeping at all. I was working 24 seven around the clock and I had so much resentment. I was like, why did this person like treat me like this? Or um, how, you know, how is this okay? And it, it took a lot and I'm telling years, years and years and years to finally get to a place of understanding and forgiveness because I held a lot of resentment inside of me. And two years after that experience is when I started practicing the mindfulness. Hmm. So if anything, and of course, what I've shared before, it could be true, it could not be true, like whatever. But a lot of, a lot of that has helped me with that forgiveness and helped me release a lot of that pain that I was like holding inside of me because I saw it in not great part of the movie industry. Um, and how people can be treated and and this goes for anyone in the movie industry not even that particular situation with me just looking as an outsider so that was really difficult i would say um hmm. but i had did to that really person that. know that they were having this impact on you not really um not really so you never time. confronted them with it you never said right this is how i feel, how you're making me feel i did this year um, the only contact information i had was through instagram but i don't think i don't know if my message was was read or not um but no at the time i didn't i kept quiet i was like i signed a contract i can't say anything i can't speak up i have to do what i'm told and you know, I'm the, and now I look back and I'm not blaming that other person. I'm like, I could have easily stuck up for myself and held my ground and created boundaries or just opened up that conversation. So that was a huge lesson for me in my own growth of not blaming, but learning from my past mistakes and how I communicate and the boundaries that I have with myself and what I'm able to do. Yeah, that's really important. I, I, I love that you shared that. So thank you. I, I think in terms of this whole speaking up thing, it's so vital. And if we look around the world at the moment, there's lots of people speaking up about lots of different things. And mm -hmm. while some of it is in a chaotic manner and destructive, mm -hmm. I think the fact that voices are being opened up, I, I think, and it goes, you know, go back to your case, what would have happened if you had said something and said, 
you know, stop or I want to talk to you about this or we need to have a chat or whatever. You know, we don't know the outcome, do we? Because it's a hypothetical. But I think in a lot of situations we find ourselves in life, if we don't give, particularly if there's another person involved, if we don't give the person the, the opportunity to be aware mm -hmm. and to, to change and, and all the rest of it. You know, I look at this Harvey Weinstein thing and ironically it's the industry you're talking about here, right? Correct. And I, and I think that, and not for one second am I, am I advocating what he did, but we all know that he's not alone in that industry and he's not the only male that has done that and he's not the only... But, but how do we confront these situations when they happen rather than letting them come out decades later when lives have been ruined and... Mm -hmm you know, all the rest of it, I, I think we have a responsibility to ourselves to say, hey, when something happens to me, it's like when you cut your finger, you, you immediately feel what's happened to you, right? And you go and do something about it. You either clean it or you bandage it or you do whatever. It's an instant response. Yet when something happens to us psychologically, we, we react in a different way a lot of the time and we, we hold on to it. And then it manifests into the situation that you were talking about that it impacted you for so long afterwards, which I think is very sad. And mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a way to, to change that and to get people to be braver and to speak up because it comes down to courage as well, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. And it, it comes down to like being vulnerable. And yeah, like I had it was before there was any like, movements going and it wasn't like huge. I just was suffering in silence. And yeah. I didn't know who to talk to. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm 23. And there's all these powerful people on set, like who I have to do a good job. And, mm. you know, I have to be perfect at what I'm doing and holding these super high standards for myself. And, you know, that experience, that person and other people were just mirror images of what I needed to really fix within myself. Mm. And I am now looking back on it. And I am thankful for the, you know, what I went through. It, I think it brought me to tapping into the mindfulness um, at a young age at, you know, eight years ago. So it yeah. brought me to that moment and that I can, is what I'm so thankful for in my life. But I do wish that I had someone to talk to or someone who understood what I was going through because yeah. I didn't know where to turn. So it is nice to see that people are, you know, for different circumstances, I will say, <laughs> like mine was not like you know, hard, like that bad, but, mm. um, people standing up for a cause or standing up for their rights in a night, in a mindful way, like what you said, not maybe not vicious. Mm. Um, and that's been, you know, with the whole, even the whole me too movement that has come out for women or what mm. people are standing up for now. And, but also being my, yeah, I think it's just doing what feels best for you, but not also not reacting out of fear and not reacting in a place of anger. We're all angry, but not acting in a place where you're trying to sabotage someone for your, like, like maliciously sabotaging somebody. Yes, mm, people mm. need to, Harvey Weinstein needs to get convicted 100%. We all need to share our stories, but, be, but we also have to stand gra um, grounded in our, who we are as humans. Does that make sense? Mm, in our mm. belief systems and what we preach as well. Mm. So having worked in that industry and, you know, for, for listeners that haven't seen a photograph of Natalie, she's been blessed with attractive looks and all the rest of it. So from that time, Natalie, when you were working in that industry right through to this very day, have you had a lot of experience with, you know, the the kind of sexist racism towards you as a, as a young girl? Um, Has it been prevalent throughout your life yeah, from men? Yeah, I would... Yes, but nothing that has like greatly affected me. Mm. Um, I've had male coaches my whole life. Um, you know, there has been in the past like that I felt like sexist vibe before. Mm. Um, I have worked in, yeah, even working, I worked at um, a movie studio and it was mostly men, mm. but I never let that really hold me back or stand in my way. And I never felt like I never, it never affected me to a point where I needed to seek help. I was always vocal about it or I was able to communicate and set boundaries. I think boundaries is a big one. 
um, mm. in that regards, I have been able to do that for sure. Mm. Because you see, and, and again, you've been in a, in a sporting, you know, competitive environment where you've had that coaching thing going on as well. Mm -hmm. And you've only got to look at, you know, all these things that have happened recently. And I highlight the United States mm -hmm. gymnastics scene as being something that's mm -hmm. been horrid as far as uh, what's mm -hmm. happened in, in that space. And mm -hmm. there's, there seems to be, and I'm generalizing when I say this, but there seems to be this terrible um, undercurrent of inertia that's happening across lots of different forms of our society whether it be in the movie industry whether it be in the sporting field um, also in the corporate world there, there's a lot of that um, there's two sides to the coin though isn't there because let's face it there are women who use that to their advantage isn't there and and that's also creating a dangerous landscape i feel because where does the truth actually sit if you have an allegation coming out from a woman against a man mm -hmm. for whatever inappropriate behavior um, it's not always that it's truthful or honest, right? Oh, and that's what I was saying. If you're standing your ground on something, make sure it's coming from a truthful place. Yeah. You know, like yeah. make sure what you're like, if you want to get behind something, don't do it because it's trendy there. You have to be truthful about it and not just trying to, you know, blow up the truth too. Like it mm. goes, like women need to think that as well. Yeah. Um, but with this, with the sporting industry as well, I yeah I have it I've watched the the gymnast documentary actually um, and luckily I've never known anyone or have experienced that in that regards but I have experienced um, comments about like weight and how much people should weigh I used to have weigh-ins all every week three times a week wow, wow. yeah mm -hmm. for diving yeah in college. was weight a big thing for diving was it yeah mm -hmm. I've been told wow. I've been too fat I've been told I'm too skinny I've been told everything wow yeah wow mm -hmm. <laughs> so so how, how yeah. old were you when you were at your prime of your your diving career oh the prime i was i there was i would say 17 i was at 17 the prime. Mm -hmm. okay so you're still really young right and to yeah. to have all those things right so how did you deal with that like what was your did you go home crying to, to mum and dad or how, how did you deal with it? It didn't start till college. I was really lucky when I was younger. I never had um, that experience. Um, mm. I had a tough coach when I was young, but mm. I loved my coach and, you know, his toughness, I really think shaped me into who I am today. So I, I loved my diving experience. When I got into college, that's where things kind of changed. Mm. Um, I wasn't too happy with diving. Um, again, like my coach was, my coach was nice. I had nice teammates, but it just, something shifted and something didn't feel right for me. And that's mm. just my personal experience. Um, I didn't love it anymore. I definitely have called my parents <laughs> before and been really upset. Um, and at the time, so that was between the age of, I would say like 18 or 19 to 21. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. I've very been, formative <laughs> years of your life right yeah. so and again yeah. you took the attitude of embracing it and seeing the good that could come out of it rather than seeing that it was being destructive for you well do you know what do you know what it taught me mark i actually stood my ground and when there was a comment made to me of like maybe uh, whether it was about the weights or like lifting weights or my personal weight a at one point i did speak up and i was like no like i'm I spoke up for myself and that gave that gave me a sense of power back and that made me be like wow I can stick up for myself and I can speak my truth versus it kind of raveling out of control so mm -hmm. while yes like again not always a pleasant experience and I wasn't the only one they were weighing everybody like it wasn't just me <laughs> so yeah. um but looking looking back at that what I've been personally you know, faced, it did help me create boundaries and stand up yeah. for myself. So talking about that, I guess, in terms of a lot of things that we've already talked about today, whether it be spirituality, our, our you know, f our first career steps and the things that evolved us to the things that you're just talking about now in mm -hmm. terms of boundaries, where, where has that led you to in terms of personal relationships in your life, in terms of how, mm -hmm. how have you attracted the people that you want to be with? I feel very lucky, Mark. I've always had an amazing support system and amazing friend group. Mm. Um, that is just something that has been very strong for me my whole life. Um, 
you, you know, some friends come and go, of course, that's super normal. But I look back at my younger days and even high school and college and after college work, I've always been surrounded by some legit, solid people. <laughs> so I think it's being discerning when it comes to friends. And if you, if someone who's listening is out there and they're having, there's a friend that puts them down or makes them feel bad or it, then it's time to let that person go. So just being discerning with your friends. But I've been very thankful that I've had a great group behind me. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's a really important point because I think that we tend to at times spend too much energy on people that are not bringing value into our life. And again, that's a barometer that only you can determine in terms of if you feel they're bringing value or not. But I think a lot of people need to be more conscious of um, being tougher, right? And saying, look, yeah. I don't need that energy in my life. And as you alluded to at the beginning of the show about how we are all energy, mm -hmm. it, it goes without saying that if we're attracting that bad energy, there's a reason for that. And it's often because we need to do something, work on ourselves yes. so that we're not attracting that, that bad energy. Yeah, Of course, all aspects of our life. And for me, it's been more of that job, for example, I had to ch fix something within myself massively. I had to go through that experience. Mm. There's things I could have done and learned and stuck up for myself. But yes, when it comes to friends, it's just being discerning, feeling the vibe of that person, feeling the energy. If something's off, then trust your gut. It's probably off. <laughs> so yeah. 100%. So 33 years old, Nat, what does life look like for you today? Oh, well... I've been in quarantine for five months, mm. so no, <laughs> I can't complain. No, um, do you know, life is ever evolving and ever changing. Ever since I left my corporate job and moved abroad, it surprised me in so many ways. Um, you know, and going back to the attachment, which is so interesting. I taught two classes today, and that happened to be the theme, attachment, mm. So and non-attachment. Having the non-attachment to the future and always having to plan things out has been one of the greatest gifts. So I definitely have goals and visions and that I want to accomplish. And, you know, the soul growth process is a lifelong journey, so that will always be there. <laughs> yeah. But I do hope to, like, my goal is to always help people um, be of service. I think that's a big mission for me in this lifetime is really to be of service and to teach other people just some of the tools that I've learned for mindfulness and you can believe whatever you want to believe and that's totally okay for we're all spiritual beings and everyone's on their own path in the right mind it doesn't matter if you believe in this or not and helping all types of people traveling cultures so we'll I will we'll see what happens Mark it's gonna be very mm. interesting what's your prediction Bring out the crystal ball. What's you gonna? What's your life gonna look like in ten years from now? Do you reckon? Well, I'll be. I'll definitely be traveling more. I hope to continue like the wellness coaching that I've been doing, um, and sharing the message of mindfulness and spirituality. I would love to start a nonprofit um, and to give keep giving back to people. Um, I love working with people. So ten years from now, I hope to be traveling, doing that in some regards bringing mm. some people on board with me, some friends, and um, just keep sharing the message. So, mm. mm -hmm. There's three million registered not-for-profits in the world today. Why would you want to start another one? Do you know what? I don't even care if it's starting one or not. Maybe it's a documentary series, just a way mm. to help people. Right. Finding that way to help people, and that's been ever-changing. It's been through events. It's been personally meeting people after a natural disaster. It's been raising funds. So that, for me, it's been even just donating now in COVID, you know, donating half of my yoga profits. So I'm open to how that happens. Um, I'm not going to pinpoint exactly how, but something where the lives of others um, can be changed for the better and giving hope, more hope to people. Yeah, cool. Let's talk about ego. I'm I'm really interested in talking about <laughs> ego because um, it drives so much of who we are and what we do and lots of different capacities and also other people yeah. around us. What What's your take on ego? You know, ego definitely is a big wide word that's talked about and it has its place in a sense. You know, we, we need 
ego in some regards to live or we're just going to be floating around. But when the ego gets out of control, and that's normally a fear-based, stress-related anxiety, um, that's when we learn need to learn how to control our ego. And to me, the ego is really what our mind comes up with. It's that inner dialogue that tells us we're not good enough, we need to be better, and which is simply not true. We that is that is all false. The ego comes about more easily or comes about greater when we lose our intuition and when our intuition gets lost in our mind and that's why when people say suppressing the ego it's because what you know through meditation or yoga it's because through those mindfulness practices you build on your intuition so when that voice comes up it's not as strong and you're able to recognize the difference between your gut feeling and trusting yourself versus this chatterbox that's in your mind so it's that when our egos inflate, maybe it's that disconnection between our, between ourselves, between our intuition. Has there been any time of your life journey thus far that you've you you would say that you've been egotistical about anything? Yeah, let's see. Like in particular, yeah, I put a lot of pressure on myself to be when I was younger. Um, to be a certain way, to look a certain way. A, a lot of that stems from um, the diving situation and working in the movie industry mm -hmm. um, because I've seen other actors and actresses struggle with how they had to look yep. and that and that vanity side of it. And not even from them, this is like producers being like, you need to, not me, but to them, you need to lose weight, you need to look a certain way. And that kind of was like, oh my gosh, like if I'm working in this industry, that must mean that I have to be like that. Hmm. And that's where like my my ego kind of like got out of control, not out of control, but that's where I noticed like my ego come through. Of, like I had to be a certain way and act a certain way or like no one's gonna hire me or like same with diving. Oh my gosh, if my coach or whoever says I'm not, looking a certain way I have it's yeah and un unfortunately that's where for me it's it came through mm. and you also see a lot of ego um and I do love the entertainment industry don't get me wrong <laughs> I do love it um so this is not about just it's just I guess shedding light to it um I've seen a lot of egos on set and I was like oh do I have to you know act this way to get to the top and that just didn't vibe with me that just mm -hmm. felt wrong, but definitely more with the whole looking a certain way, acting a certain way. Did you want to be an actress? At one point, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. What stopped that dream? I wasn't that passionate about it. Um, my passion shifted into hosting, mm -hmm. on-air hosting, more natural, not so scripted, kind of what you know what we're doing now. Um, mm. Interviewing, it shifted in that regards. And a lot of that changed for me when I started embarking on this path of the passion to act and portray this person. Um, it wasn't as strong, like it didn't feel as authentic to myself anymore. Um, mm. A funny story though, I was taking acting classes and I did, uh, gosh, I, I like had an agent, I was taking acting classes and then I stopped it when I, and I started getting into mindfulness. And then, but I was telling all of my friends, instead of, I was going to energy healing classes, I was telling them I was going to acting school. So, right. so I was not, I think I told you that before. I think I mentioned mm. it, but <laughs> that's when I knew maybe something was changing. I was like, oh, well, I'm going now to like Reiki healing instead of my <laughs> acting classes at 25. And I was telling people I was. Um, going to acting school going but I have a um, I have family in the movie industry my aunt she's a big set designer and um, she's you know she's like she's thriving in the industry and my my mom's cousin was an actor he was bigger in the 80s and 90s so it, it's kind of in my blood I love entertainment I still love movies I mm. I started shifting to a side of really liking producing yeah. Um, bringing you know bringing it all together and putting the parts together that started vibing with me more than acting and who knows maybe one day I will get to do that but mm. definitely a 10-year if you know talking about the 10-year goal I think producing is definitely one that's up there but maybe in a different way than a big action movie <laughs> that you see who are your favorite actors and actresses I don't think I have any 
I think when mm. you work in the industry, you're kind of like, mm. <laughs> you, I don't know, like you, <laughs> like it doesn't seem so like crazy and like so glamorous mm. anymore because like working on set is just not glamorous at all. It's yeah, really yeah. long and if the days are, if it's hot out, the days are, it's just a lot. Mm. Um, one of my favorite actors though, I did get to work with, I was his personal assistant for two months, was Alan Arkin. Mm -hmm. I don't, he's, do you know who he is? He was in Little Miss Sunshine. Um, Little Miss Sunshine, yeah. 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 So I worked with him and he was so fantastic. And yep. he was at, um, he was almost a great teacher to me because he was talking to me about mindfulness. And this was in 2013. So it was about a year after I started practicing this. And I really had no one else to talk to besides the people in my Reiki healing class. So yeah. by talking to him and he taught me the importance of meditation and he gave me a whole perspective um, about the industry, not just the whole like, oh, I'm a star type of persona. Mm. Mm. So that was a pivotal moment in my life down-to-earth person yeah for sure yeah. do you have mentors in your life today I do yeah I have mentors in my life um, whew, I've had so many over the like still mentors to me um, I have an intuitive mentor um, her name's Dana so shout out to Dana she's in Atlanta she has been an amazing mentor to me for the last seven years um, and she teaches me a lot of, she has taught me a lot about um, energy work and um, how to clear your energy. And she just is, she helps give me perspective on things that I, uh, in a different way, if that makes sense. She helps show me different sides to things, like seeing beyond. Um, so she's been fantastic. But yeah, I, I always tend to have mentors in my life who guide me and teach me and um, something very important for me. How do you find your mentors? How do you come across them? How did you find Dana? Oh, the craziest way. Well, some have been through work. Um, Dale, she's another mentor of mine. She, she was a huge mentor for me in Atlanta. We worked together. Um, and she gave me my first book, Many Lives, Many Masters. And she, she looked at me and she, she goes, you're ready. And I'm like, for what? <laughs> like, mm. I, the little did I know it was this whole mindfulness path. Um, so that was through work. Um, Dana was, a, I, I randomly picked up her business card when I was at one of my energy healing classes and I had this urge to call her. So that's how that unfolded um, as well. And she's also now good friends with Jess. You know, Jess, you know, we do the show together. So the three of us are, are good friends. Mm. Um, mm. And then so through work, through random meetings, like, oh, one friend introduces me to someone who ends up being a mentor to me. So it's it's been a mix of different ways, I would say. Mm. Who inspires mm -hmm. you in the world? Who inspires me? Mm. Oh, that's a really, that's a hard question. I think mm. there's, I, I don't even know if there's one person who would inspire me. When I was younger, and this could sound totally cliche, but when I was younger, and even to this day, I would always look at Princess Diana because she was one, helping people, and two, she was going outside of the system. Mm. And that's something where I look back and I'm like, she she was a voice, she was outside of the system. She didn't think, she wasn't in that box that society puts us in. Or at least mm. that's what I perceive. Um, and I can relate to a lot of that as I don't feel like I'm part of the whole box of society, you know, and I'm sure a lot of people can out there can relate. They feel a little different. And, um, I know that she was always about helping people. And so anyone who really steps outside of the box in living their truth, I guess, and helping others is just really what's inspiring for me. And mm. also my mom <laughs> and my mom. Well, that's an important one to have is your mom. Yeah. And my mom, yeah. she's, she's been, my parents have been a great support system. And so I would say, yeah, my parents, my mom. So fantastic. Who doesn't inspire you? Like who, who are the people that you kind of, and I'm talking, you know, when I say these things, I'm talking about, you know, leaders and corporate leaders, political leaders, film stars, all that sort of stuff. Who, who kind of makes you <sighs> cringe a bit? The majority of the news, I guess I would say. Hmm. 
I think the whole political system in general makes me kind of cringe and the fear-based news we see on TV. Um, I think all the people that make up, make it up. <laughs> so no, and there's definitely still, you know, some stars that, you know, you just have to do like, look up to people who you vibe, who vibes with you. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the best thing I can say. And it's interesting because I don't always like even with actors, I don't really have like personal favorites and some of them come and go. And but when it comes to politics as a whole, not everybody, but the majority of what I see on TV makes me cringe. Mm. Mm -hmm. I want to throw a bit of a spin on that because I I don't have a TV, so I don't watch that stuff. But mm -hmm. I've found that there is a a new movement in the world today and the new movement is there's a lot of positive news out there mm -hmm. and when we're when we're talking about the mainstream media if we dig a little bit deeper uh, we'll find that there's some really exciting new platforms and i think that's what podcasting has done actually it's created podcasting is a new platform that has created a means by which everybody sitting at home can basically have an opinion on something right yeah and as a result of that if you combine that with youtube and what youtube's been able to do from a visual experience you kind of think well why why do we need tv we don't because there's what one billion videos or something on youtube and there's mm -hmm. 800 million mm -hmm. podcast episodes out there today so somewhere in amongst all of that and, and, and it comes down to like anything you do in life with searching there's content that basically fits into your wheelhouse right you can go and find stuff that you resonate with on every level in your life whether it be health and well-being whether it be work and career whether it be fitness relationships whatever it is there's something out there and i've become intoxicated in my time of looking at new ways in which to find information and digest it and and resonate towards it so I think between YouTube and podcasting, there's there's two streams available to us all now, which can give us such an enlightened approach to life that makes us feel better about everything that we're doing. And it's just a matter of clicking on those things as your favorites and, and mm -hmm. being committed to it, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, while I understand there's a lot of frustration around fake news and, and all these, you know, let's put in the brackets cable networks that are that are sending out these information there's also a lot of really uplifting exciting innovative mm -hmm. things going on in the world that people are doing that are they're they're able to create content around and hopefully we're doing it today we're having a conversation about life right and mm -hmm. how often do you get to do that and share it with the world so yeah i think that um as well as identifying all the uh, darkness that's happening around the world in lots of different areas there's so much brightness and positivity happening as well and i'm amazed every day like I'm, I'm getting to do a podcast every day at the moment i'm speaking to people about all sorts of exciting stuff and the amount of people that are coming up with innovative ideas to overcome you know lockdowns and quarantines and how to how to run their businesses more efficiently and it's just mind-blowing like i'm seeing humanity through hum completely different eyes at the moment and it's it's quite inspiring no, and you touched on a great point of, you know, finding the inspiring and the stuff beyond the TV. And I, I'm like you, Mark, I haven't had a TV for years. I mean, I have one here because of the apartment I rent in Columbia just happens to have one in the living room. But mm. I, I haven't had a TV in a really long time. Um, mm. But, you know, finding what vibes for you and finding that uplifting content and, you know, looking deeper into things. I made a note here when we're talking about ego to remind um just to say to you mm -hmm. um going to give you a book recommendation today nat oh great <laughs> in fact i'm going to give it to everybody that's listening um there's a great book written by a guy called lama marut m-a-r-u-t okay. and it's called it's called be nobody be nobody yeah and it's I about ego it's I about ego <laughs> And it's a fascinating insight. He wrote he wrote another book called um, A Good Life and a Spiritual mm -hmm. Motorbike Journey or something. Um, that was my favorite book that he wrote. But the second one I read was uh, Be Nobody. And 
he he addresses through an opinion the whole ego thing and it's spot on in my mind like you know you read it and take away what you want but he he has a look at uh, you know who we are and what drives that whole ego and the good and the bad of the ego and and at the end of the day if we can actually be nobody then we're not going to be judgmental on anybody um mm -hmm. Or anything right so yeah if you want to read that i it's a good worthwhile read it's a short book it's not a big heavy thing so i will read that for sure because get through it pretty quickly i love the saying we are everything yet we are nothing yeah yeah and be not it nobody is is all about that because let's face it we live in this world where we we label ourselves you know mm -hmm. um you know you and i've done it today you're you you said to me i'm 33 year old woman and blah 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 we're all exactly. we're all These but at the end of the day we're just we're just all energy living as we are um and and yet we're so intent on having a business title and uh, a gender oh. you know all this gender stuff going on at the moment right like you know. everything yeah well i am it's like i am this and this and this and it's like peeling yeah. off those layers it's like yeah. well when we die like sorry to be grim but we're gonna <laughs> we're not really taking much with us <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but our soul so <laughs> Totally yeah, and that's that's that. that's a that's a good one in itself. Thinking about the end of life is is the end of life something that um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and we were talking about. I, I went to a when I was living in Singapore, which I did for seven years. I came across. I was in a cafe one day working, which I used to spend a lot of my time doing, and I looked up on the wall on the notice board, and it said there was a workshop on in the weekend at the university across the road called the Art of Dying. Wow! And it kind of got my attention, right? And I thought. That's quite interesting. So I went up and I read this brochure and it said, you know, we're going to have this conversation about dying and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go along to this. So I went along the next day uh -huh. and it was f so fascinating because first of all, how often do we actually sit down and have a conversation about dying? Mm -hmm. And how often do we always put it in that box as being as something that's morbid and dark and, you know, stressful and all the rest of it? And we don't actually see the joy and understand the journey involved in dying. And it actually starts quite a long time before we actually die because, you know, we, we often become in ill health and we start to go downhill, right? Mm -hmm. And that gives us an opportunity to do, you know, embrace the journey that we're on a little bit more and be thankful and grateful for all the things that have happened. Mm -hmm. But also when you're in the presence of somebody that's going through that part of their life and how you deal with that I think is really significant and it's a bit like becoming a parent in the respect that we don't get a training manual and you know it's a lot of trial and error sort of stuff well the same thing is when we're coming to the end of the life it's not like you've been there and done it before right mm -hmm. it's not it's right. not it's not like a dive that you practice over and over again and visualize right mm -hmm. so I find this really fascinating because I don't I don't know many people and I haven't known many people that actually sit around and have a conversation about dying and their, their thoughts around it where it doesn't hit off down into that dark, horrible space, which it doesn't need to. So I went along to this workshop and anyway, they talked about, and it was really fascinating because the fact that it was in Singapore, it was very multicultural. There was Chinese, Malays, Indians, wow. uh, West, Westerners, all present in this room. So there was a lot of energy from different cultures and it was generally a really fantastic uplifting conversation about the art of dying and it, and it is an art because if you look at the end of life as um, you know a conclusion or also a commencement of the next step of the journey right yeah. um, you can you can picture it and you can contextualize it into whatever you want it to be and that's a beautiful thing and someone was just telling me the other day how a young girl who was 18 years old uh, recently was just diagnosed with a terminally ill disease and she was given a very short period of time to live and she went about planning intensely her ceremony uh, funeral ceremony and choosing the music and writing poems for people to read out and all this sort of stuff and wow. I thought I thought wow that's brilliant right that's that's embracing the art of dying right that's what it's all about to me is mm -hmm. to recognize the journey that you've had and I just wanted to share that with you today and get your thoughts on it because is it something that you sure. you ever sit down at dinner parties and talk to your friends about? I have, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for sure. So, okay, when it comes to dying, and first of all, I love that you went to an event called The Art of Dying. I love Asia and I love Singapore. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really interesting um, to you know see things in that light because it is a big part of our life because it's the end of our life and we're all going to experience it at some point. Embarking on the mindfulness path and everything I talked about, it made me less fearful whether or not this is true. Um, they say that Earth is a school and our real home is when you pass. And the feeling that you feel when you do die and you do pass is incredible. And again, I don't know this feeling, but it's something you cannot describe on earth. And you read a lot about it for people who've had near-death experiences. So they say they pass and their soul essentially leaves their body. And there's millions and millions of you know cases of this now. Um, so their soul leaves their body and the feeling that they feel is incredible. That a lot of people don't even want to go back into their bodies to wake up. And, and this can be like a car accident or say, say you're struggling with um, you know, a terminal illness. So it, this could be like your soul leaves your body and that feeling of oneness you know, that we had talked about earlier, this feeling, this ever-presence. Again, I've never had this experience, so I can't say. But that, that feeling has made people not afraid to die because they're like, wow, this feels like the best thing ever. I don't even want to come back to earth. So reading that and, you know, whether again, you vibe in that or not, there's a lot of documentaries about it. And I, I personally met um, one or two people who've had that experience. It made me not so scared to die and be afraid. Um, again, if you don't believe in anything after life, that's, again, that's okay. And that's your path. But um, if, if you look at it that way, if that is the case, then that doesn't seem so bad, <laughs> I guess. It hmm. seems um, seems like there's life, you know, past our body, in a different let, sense. Let me play devil's advocate for a sure. second. Sure, yes, let's do it. Do you think a lot of these people that kind of say things like, "I had a near death experience and it was beautiful and mm-hmm. peaceful and blissful and all this," do do you think those people are wrapped up in this notion that life's going to be better after I'm dead? Like there's going to be something better than what we're experiencing now? Do you think it's there's a lot of hope built into that? Do you know, it depends. Um, there was a woman in California and she um, she had stage four cancer hmm. and she was literally on her deathbed and she, so she passed, well, I guess she kind of passed and she had this feeling when she passed. And again, this was not my experience. So what you're saying is very valid. Um, I'm not too sure. Hmm. But when she passed, what how she described it was, I realized that everything that I was worried about doesn't really matter. All the stress and worry, which initially caused her cancer, they say disease is dis-ease within the body, like dis mm. slash ease. Mm. Mm. And she had this opportunity to come back. They resuscitated her back to life in the hospital bed. And within a few months, her cancer was gone. Mm-hmm. So there's just these crazy stories that it's like, what's true and what's not true? I don't know. Um mm. But I do have, a, just for my personal way of viewing things and looking at things, I, I, I do think or hope that we continue past our bodies, that we are mm. a soul, we are a body having, or we are a soul having a earthly ex- experience. Um, so, so, so you're not wanting things to come to a definitive end. You, you think that your belief system's telling you that you'd like to believe that there's something. Correct that we move on to or into or whatever it is, you know? Yes. I would like yeah. to believe that. And I guess I'll find okay. out when it's my time and we all, as we all will. Yeah. Um, but that feeling of we're beyond our, you know, we're, we're beyond our physical bodies. We're so much more to it than a physical body. Mm. That's what vibes with me, even just through my experience through life. Like, I'm like, there's no way I'm just this, feel-. but that's just my opinion. There's no, like, um, the feelings I get through meditation or the mindful, the, the visualizations through diving, like that's, that's a higher power. That's not me. Mm. Like, you know, that's just not, there has to be more than what meets the eye. I'll share something with you, Nat. Yeah. There's been twice on my life journey so far where I've been clinically dead. Really? Yeah. What happened? And <laughs> <laughs> well, everything stopped. That's what happened. Oh my gosh. And um I I didn't have any I didn't have any experience. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you about white lights and tunnels yeah. and 
all that sort of stuff. I had I had complete nothingness. Like there was mm-hmm. completely nothing. It was blacked out. Everything was just completely. Mm-hmm. You know that period yeah. of time I was gone. I have no recognition of it at mm-hmm. all um, in terms of anything that happened to me or with me. Or yeah. um, one one of the times I was in an ambulance and I woke up and I was in the hospital. So it was a case of that period of time where I was gone. I wasn't there, right? So I mm-hmm. couldn't remember anything. I didn't have any recollection of mm-hmm. activities or people around me or anything mm-hmm. that happened. I just I came conscious again, and there I was in a bed in a hospital. So. Um, yeah, that was the experience. So I find this really fascinating because mm-hmm. as we do when we're living life, we have all kinds of different experiences, don't we? So yeah. who's who's to say that we don't have different experiences when that time of our life comes, you know? Yeah. Um, and but I'm going to play devil's well. advocate now too. Yeah. What if yeah. you, what if, what if you passed and you had an experience, but you weren't allowed to remember it going back in your body? Yeah, yeah, that's quite possible, right? So I'm open to that. I'm definitely open to that. Mm-hmm. I think also the other um, incredible thing that I got from it was that I actually came back, right? Wow, that's so, incredible. So I was, I was thinking, no, no, I was given too much medication. <laughs> wow. By the ambulance officers, by the way. <laughs> wow. So they effectively killed me. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't want to throw out liability and stuff there. But <laughs> Yeah, right, I know. <laughs> I, I won't go into details. But, yeah, that's what happened. And um, mm-hmm. they were doing the right thing, by the way, because I was in so much pain and, and they were yeah. trying to sedate me, right? But they went overboard with that. And uh, But but the, the realization of that, and I had a lot of reflection around this afterwards, was mm-hmm. why did I come back, right? Like what was mm-hmm. what was bringing that? You know, when you say the words eternal light, life, mm-hmm. right, eternal life, what does that actually mean? Like, does it mean I, I was going to continue no matter what, whether I was dead or alive, there was always going to be a presence of me mm-hmm. somehow? Yeah. And then when I came back, what was the purpose of me coming back? Was there a message there? Was there a, and as you just said about the lady before she, she got rid of her cancer and she went on, well... Was it was it an epiphany moment for me in my life? No, it wasn't actually. It didn't make me wake up and say, "Hey, you've got to go out starting mm-hmm. to get fit tomorrow and change your diet and you know mm-hmm. do all these other things." It, it definitely didn't have that impact on yeah. me. It was a, there was a great awareness around what had happened in terms of, "Wow, I'm lucky to be here," mm-hmm. but there wasn't this kind of get out there and change everything about your life, quit your job, buy a boat, mm-hmm. sail around the world, and you know live a in Hawaii, right? For you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was a different lesson for you. You know, we were all ready when we're ready to, not ready, but we all have to experience certain things as we meet them, I guess. Yeah, and I it's think also where, where we're at at the, at the time on our emotional and spiritual path, I think is really important as well. I agree, I agree. Really important. It's just but, being true to you, you know? Like, do what, mm. do what feels right for you. Like, intuit, like, that's why I meditate. And do what feels right, even if you believe in nothing. Like that's, I have friends who are agno- all different types of religious beliefs or agnostics and no beliefs and spiritual beliefs. Yeah. And that's, and that's totally okay. But find that place of knowing. I was um, researching the other night and I came across an interesting fact that the Indian culture talks about the five stages of death or the f- five stages mm. of dying. Are you aware of those? Maybe. I've, I'm picturing stages in my mind, but I don't know if it's the exact ones you're talking about. Okay, so... <laughs> what do yeah, they, they say? Talk, well, they talk about how when the body um, dies, right? Yeah. How there's five different stages of how the energy is transferred away from the body. So it actually is dead. And it takes uh-huh. up to 14 hours after you're actually dead for that to happen. Wow. So in the Indian culture, that's one of the reasons why they don't cremate you straight away is because Mm -hmm. they want the body to finish its journey completely Mm -hmm. before they actually cremate you or bury you in in the other alternative, I guess, right? And um, I was just recalling this the other day when I was talking to somebody about my father's passing and and I was sitting there with him. And Mm -hmm. you know how they say sometimes after someone's dead, their body twitches? Yes. Right? So you can see a hand movement or you can... Yeah. see an eye flutter or something like that right so this is exactly what the indian culture is talking about it's talking about there's still this energy flowing through the body even though the heart stopped mm-hmm. um the the mind is still in a state of some consciousness 
and therefore the energy flows that are going through the body take some time to dissipate for you to become actually clinically dead. So when a doctor comes in and takes your pulse and says, nope, they're dead, that's not actually the case. There's still life Ooh. going on within inside you. Yeah. Wow. And that's why, you know, there's been cases, I guess, where, um, and I'm not talking about movies here, I'm talking about real life mm -hmm. where, you know, people have been clinically diagnosed as dead and then some hours later their arms move or their foot twitches or something happens um, wow. to show that the wires, the connections within are still going, yeah. Wow. I've so I find that, that really fascinating. Heard. Yeah, I have I find that, that really that. fascinating. Hmm. Because is this a is this a doorway, a connection to what's next in terms of where we're equipping ourselves to, to go to the next dimension? I wonder if it's all part of that journey, right? Yep, never know. Maybe it is the next life, the next <laughs> back to our true home. You never know. Back to our true home. Yeah. Well, listen, it's um, what is it? Friday night over there? Where, what what are you? Where, it's no, Thursday, Thursday night. night. It's Thursday night here. Thursday night in Columbia. Well, yeah. I better let you get back to your <laughs> your life. It's been great having a chat, though. I've really it's enjoyed been it. So much fun. I love talking about this stuff, and I love going deep and you know it, it's always fascinating to me and i learn so much every time so thank you for sharing yeah likewise and um we'll do some reflection on this and i'm sure you'll be back on one of my shows in the not too distant future so always enjoy having you around natalie and uh, thank you also for your um friendship in my life you've come into my life in recent times and um you've stayed here which has been good and uh, there's a lot of value in that so i want to just show my appreciation for you always being there for me at, in different times well thank you and likewise like thank you for being there for me and um, giving me the opportunity to come and have these conversations with you um, to share and that means a lot to me so thank you terrific and to everybody listening i want to show my and share my appreciation and gratitude for you because um you know whilst it's great to have a conversation with all these people around the world there's also an awareness around maybe whatever we're talking about somewhere sometime might actually help someone if that's the case then it makes it all the more better as well so thank you for listening Absolutely. to the show today natalie we will talk again sometime very soon sounds good take care there we are everyone that was natalie thomas talking to me today on the humanity inspires podcast show i hope you enjoyed that particular episode always great to have real conversations with people if you're sitting out there and you'd like to be on the show reach out on social media and we'll have a conversation about you getting on the show it's easy as that no matter where you are in the world if you're looking for other podcasts, head over to globaltravelchannel.com. Check out over 150 episodes of me talking to people around the world about their amazing travel experiences and how travel has changed people's lives for the better. And if you're into business, check out the globalbusinesspodcast.com. Yes, that's my other show. We're talking to business leaders and business owners across the world about how they're navigating their times through COVID-19 some innovative and fantastic ideas coming out of a lot of business leaders around the world check that out show out and i'm sure you'll be amazed as well so there we go folks plenty to listen to in the podcasting world thank you very much for giving me your time today and listening to our show if you do like our content don't forget to tell a family member a friend or even a work colleague about the humanity inspires channel the global travel channel or the global business podcast there we go. My name's Mark Philpot. I look forward to the next time I have an opportunity to do a podcast for you. Until then, stay safe, stay well, and I'll be back soon. Mm -hmm.